book I wrote in about 1975 was, as Rick mentioned, the, the history of the Hungarian uprising of 1956 against the communist occupation of Hungary, for which I had access to a certain number of CIA files, which were very interesting because the CIA carried out in-depth psychological interrogations of a large number of the Hungarian refugees who came to this country after 1956. And there was no doubt in my mind a very interesting discovery indeed, which I wasn't aware of until I began investigating that. I didn't realize this. The reason I began writing a book about the Hungarian uprising was entirely irrelevant. I decided to write a book about something other than Hitler and the Third Reich, just to show that I wasn't in a rut. But the odd thing was that when I began writing that book, I discovered from the CIA files that the Hungarian people, when they started that uprising, it began as an anti-Jewish pogrom. It was essentially an anti-Jewish revolution and not an anti-communist revolution to begin with for the first few days. The Hungarian people regarded that their government in the 1950s as being a Jewish government. And they regarded the secret police, the dreaded Alan Wedel Mihatoshag, the AVH, as being a Jewish secret police. And it, essentially it was, because when the Red Army entered Hungary in 1945, they brought back into Hungary all the Jews who had taken refuge in the Soviet Union and they were the ones who got the plum jobs, and they were the ones who got the trustworthy jobs as secret police chiefs and as torturers. And that's why the Jews were so hated in Hungary by 1956, because they were regarded as the people who had inflicted this nameless misery on the Hungarian people. And so the uprising began as an anti-Jewish uprising. Every one of the Hungarian leaders at that time in 1956, Rakosi and Farkas and Gero and the rest of the Hungarian leaders, they were all Jews. And I never realized that when I set out to write it. It's an extraordinary fact, the way these things are kept away from the public consciousness. And, uh, of course, inevitably, when the book came out, I was accused of anti-Semitism for having written it. But what am I supposed to do when you discover something as a historian? Are you supposed to try and pretend it isn't that? And if you do pretend it isn't that, you're doing the Jewish people more harm than good, I think. <clears throat> I delivered a lecture in Shreveport. Uh, in Louisiana about six months ago and on this occasion the audience was about as large as this but half the audience had been taken over by the local Jewish community and they decided to wreck my meeting by barracking and by interrupting and by being thoroughly obnoxious and after an hour of this with the rest of the audience getting very restless at the way they were not being permitted to hear me deliver my lecture I then said to the leader of the Jewish community who was attacking me I said it just came to me like this. I said, I look at myself in the mirror in the mornings and I know that I'm disliked. I've been called disliked by reviewers in England. Uh, the Sunday Times called me the most disliked historian in Britain, which caused me to write a letter to the Sunday Times saying, is it the historian's duty to be liked, therefore? And how do you know that I'm the most disliked historian in Britain? Do you stand in Oxford Street with a clipboard asking people, what do you think about historians? How do you rate David? And, oh, he's most disliked. I know, I said to this Jewish mob in my audience, that I am disliked, and I know why I'm disliked. Now, you people have been disliked for 3,000 years. Do you ever look in the mirror and ask yourselves why you are disliked? That might be very... No, I didn't mean it in, a, I didn't mean it in, a, in an offensive way. I meant it as a helpful, self-analytical way, the way that the communists, the Marxists, to self-criticize and self-analyze. Have you ever analyzed yourselves as race? and said to yourselves, we have been hounded and persecuted and harried and massacred for 3,000 years, why us? And they never ask themselves that question, do they? They never ask them that they come along and they harry and persecute others and they behave in a thoroughly obnoxious way, as I probably behave in their eyes, but they never ask themselves why and they never cure their own faults. One of the, the, the leader of, the, of, the, of this faction in the audience stood up furiously from his accent I could tell not only that he came from England but from London and from his accent in fact I could tell from which corner of London he came from because England our accents are like that we're very class conscious in England we can tell what class somebody is by their accent and we can tell which street almost they come from if you've seen my fair lady you'll know this and I said you come from Collindale don't you and he said how do you know that I said your accent gives you away and he, and he was the leader of the gang and he said, are you accusing us? Are you saying that we are responsible for Auschwitz, ourselves? And it's a bit of a dazzling question, and when you think about it, I said, well, the short answer is yes. 
But that's a cruel answer because to do the question justice, you've got to have a lot of intervening stages, of course. But the short answer, if you want to hop from A to Z, is yes. If you hadn't behaved the way you have as a race for 3,000 years, first the Russians, then the Poles, then the Galicians, then the Austrians and the rest wouldn't have harried and hounded you from pillar to post, so you end up finding yourselves in Auschwitz. And you've never asked yourselves why. And they still don't want to accept that. To him that question and my answer was unacceptable. In Germany, it would no doubt have been grounds for another $22,000 fine. In Canada, I would have probably found myself in handcuffs again. But I don't think it was an anti-Semitic answer. It was an attempt to be helpful in a kind of psychiatrist couch way. Analyze yourself. Cast out the moat from thine own eye.